come. Now is the time to worship. Oh, come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God.
Crossings Church. Uh, we are so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, for today, uh, we have gone back to uh, Zoom, to our uh, streaming uh, service, which we will be continue to doing as we do in person. But because we had our marriage retreat this weekend, uh, we decided that, that because so many couples were away that we were going to do a uh, Zoom service just this week, and then next week we go back to in person. So if you are uh, available, please come to our service at the Christian Academy of Greater St. Louis. Um, if not, we will be continuing the, our streaming service. So uh, before uh, we start, uh, I'd like to just say a prayer, and then we'll go ahead and start. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the incredible God that you are. Thank you for just times that we get to get away with our, our, our spouses and 
Lord, and work on our marriages, but I ask you to be for the people that haven't been able to go and are watching on this this streaming now, Lord, just remembering that, that you love everyone, Lord, and, and you want everybody to have a relationship with you, Lord. Help us to, to not forget that, to, to keep in mind that uh, we are discipling people and that we're trying to help people grow so that they can have the kind of life that you want them to, Lord. Thank you for your son and everything that he's done, Lord, and um, just help us to have the, the heart that he does and, and the incredible sacrifice that he has for people so that your kingdom can grow. Thank you for everything he does. It's in his, in your name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are, um, actually had been in a series, uh, which is about our theme, uh, Less is More, uh, which it talks about us being less and Christ being more. But for this Valentine's Day we decide, weekend, we decided that we were going to kind of veer off of that uh, and come back to that next week and finish out uh, that series. But today I want to talk a little bit about something that's that's more connected to not this holiday, because it's not a holiday, but this, this date. And I know there are people that like it, and there are people that don't like it, and it depends on, on where you are in a relationship with somebody. Uh, but there's something ab- about Valentine's that, that should be the central thing. And we're talking about love. And the, and the theme of the, the lesson today is growing a love that lasts. And if you want to follow with us, uh, there are notes there. There will be a link uh, right below where you're watching it, that you can uh, get those notes and follow along with us. And there are the passages there for you, and that hopefully later, well, the reason we do that is so that you can uh, study those a- at some times. But growing a love that lasts. And the idea of, of lasting is that it's the important thing. Because if you look in the mirror every day, uh, you know that stuff is changing. You know, that, that you're getting older, that, you know, uh, you don't have as, as much hair that you did there before, you know, or there are more wrinkles and, and, you know, there's a little more fat or less fat, you know, things, things change. And that's the nature of things that are temporary. But if it's something is temporary and there are other things that are eternal, then you're not going to focus on the temporary as much because the eternal is the thing that's more important. It's, it's the long term, and it's something that's changed today because it seems like everybody wants everything now and everything that's now and, and happiness, th- and, and it's all for, for, the, for the moment. But the truth is that if we're really going to invest wisely, that we need to invest in what is eternal. And there's one thing that you can be certain that will never change, and it's the love that God has for you, that it will never, ever change that God has told us that, and even and it, it doesn't matter what, what our position was because he gave his son when we were enemies. He gave his son before on the, on the cross before we had allegiance with him. So he loved us even at that time. And th- it shows us that the God, love of God is not something that's temporary, that he will never love you any more or any less. He loves you now, and he loves you the same. And I wanted to look at a passage that says in Jeremiah 31, uh, the second 31 verse 3, he says, I have loved you with an, everlasting, la- sorry, with an everlasting love. That means a love that does not end. But if we look on the message paraphrase, uh, what, he sa- what it says there of that same passage, it says, I've never quit loving you and I never will. And that's something that should, that should reassure us. And reaffirm this, this idea that, that, it, that it is eternal. And it doesn't matter how you look or, 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 or several other things that you would consider. Because God loves us. And he loves us the same. But let me tell you what the rest of the story is. And sometimes we don't, li- we don't like this. That in John fifteen twelve it says, I command you to love each other in the same way that I loved you. So he asks us to love love others in the same way that, that he loves us. And, and I don't know how you feel about it, but, it's, but it, it, may, it begs this question, is it even possible to have this everlasting love for others? Is this, this love something that's real, that we know that God has it, but can we reciprocate? Can we do that for other people? So let me tell you a little bit of uh, some statistics here that tells us about this, this, uh, this idea of what love is. The divorce rate in America today, or when this survey was made, uh, was 41% for first-time marriages. Overall, it's, it's way higher, but, but for first-time marriages, it's 
For, its, for second time marriages, it is 60%. And for, seven and for uh, third time marriages, it's actually 73%. That we were saying, look, the track record is worse. It doesn't make you think, you know, oh, oh, I was married once or twice and, and I know how to do it and it'll be better on the third time. No, that, that things aren't better. They just get worse. And the truth about this idea of, of love is that anybody can fall in love. It's like falling into a ditch. You know, you're just walking there. You see somebody, this idea you fall in love, you, you just fell into this, into this thing. The problem is that it takes a lot more to stay in love that it takes to fall in love. That it's because it includes choices that we make. So it's not that initial infatuation of what they look like or, or how they make you feel. It's about these tough choices when the relationship gets, gets harder. And, and choosing over and over to do the things that it takes to stay in love rather to this idea to fall in love. And what we want to do this, this Valentine's is, is we're going to look at that from, from what God's Word says. It, is it even possible to have that la- a love that lasts an entire lifetime or even more than that? So let me tell you this that Mark Twain said. He says, you don't really know the depths, depths of real love until you've been married 25 years. <laughs> And one idea is you can get along uh, on looks for five or six, but after that it, it gets, it gets kind of tough. And I haven't been married that long for 25 years yet, so I can't tell you how it'll be then. Uh, my, my parents are actually going to be married uh, now for, uh, they're going to have their 50th uh, wedding anniversary. Uh, theirs is actually 9-11, so it's one of those dates that, you know. But, and, and, it, and it took, and, and I remember seeing the tough times and the things that it took for them to remain married. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. They had to overlook some things. That what happens in this time is that you're going to, to be tested. And there are several things, and all these are going to have D on them. So it's a doubt, depression, despair, differences. There's going to be disagreements. There's going to be disappointments and defeats. By, you're going to be dis- disappointed by some things you're going to have because of distance because of delays, because of dead ends, debt and disease, by all these demands on your life, the things that happen. And it's not easy to stay together when you you consider all those things. But you can avoid the big D that we talked about, that is divorce. That you can go through all those things and realize in the end of all this time that you're still together. And it's not the end of it. And it's like, if we can get, get through these crazy times that we've gone through, you know, if you can get through 2020, you know, you're going to be okay. Because in, in certain places, the amount of, the, the rate of, div- of divorce, for example, in the country where I'm for, in, from in Brazil, has kind of skyrocketed in 2020. Why? Because people have been forced to be together and they don't like each other. So it's, it's making these tough decisions. And the reason you can, and many have made it, uh, these 25 years is because of these tough choices. And I'm going to tell, tell you this. Look, they're not always popular. They're not easy. And a lot of times they're not convenient. But these choices are what keep, keeps you together. Because let me tell you this, and this is a reality, is that love is not a feeling. And, and people might say, what are you talking about? I, I feel these things. And, and what it does, it produces feelings. Love does produce feelings. But if love were a feeling, then God couldn't have commanded it. Because you you can't command feeling. You can't tell your little kid who, you know, who's who's upset about something and is crying, you're gonna say, hey, hey, uh, Jai, be be happy. (laughs) Right? Be happy now. It's not gonna, oh, you want me to be okay, you know how it is. You can't, it's it's hard to change your feelings. So the idea is that love is a choice that produces feelings, it does. But if you stop loving, then it's your choice. That don't, <laughs> don't complain to anybody, you know, I just lost this love. No, you were choosing to stop loving. And, and whether in all this we're talking about getting married or not, we need to learn about the love that God has because of all our relationships, whether it's with friends, families, and any kind of relationship. It's going to take love and this choice. So if we're going to learn to love, 
we will need to make four important choices. And the main passage that we're talking about here comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And if you know chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians, it's the chapter about love, where God says what love is and what it isn't and, and, and when you actually are showing love or when you're not. But it says this in 1 Corinthians 13, 7. It says, love never stops being patient. Oh. Tough choice. <laughs> it never stops believing. It never stops hoping. And it never gives up. So we're going to look at four things here that we just talked about, of four choices that make love last. And these are the four things that it's going to take to continue this love. And remember, I'm not, I'm not talking just about this romantic love that, that we have. I'm talking about a pure form of love that we have for friends, that we have for family, for our kids, for, for, for people that are, that are out there that sometimes we don't even know, the lost. And the first thing that's going to have to happen is for this love to last is one, that lasting love extends grace. It extends grace. And you, I told you that these are going to be some tough choices, and you can see it already, right? This idea of grace. And we'll spend the most time on this one because the, the longer you're in a relationship with someone, the harder it is to be gracious. It, it really is. That if you're going to have a love that lasts, that you will have to choose to be merciful. <laughs> you're going to have to choose to be loving. You're going to have to choose to be gracious. You're going to have to choose to forgive. You're going to have to choose to be patient. You're going to have to cut people slack. In any relationship, you will need a lot of patience. And that's hard because we, we, people are going to do things that, that you don't like or that irritate you and that just, uh, just get under your nerves. So, so what do you do? And, y and you feel sometimes, you know, uh, people that are more forgiving, like, oh, you know, I can, I can forgive one time. <laughs> the problem is when it goes on and on and on and on, what do I do? And here's, here's where we're able to give that answer looking at God's word. So 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7, and you'll notice there in your notes that we put several different, um, different versions for you to see what it says and some nuances in there. So in, in, the, in God's word, it says, love never stops being patient. And the message, it says, it puts up with anything. The New Century Version says, patiently accept, accepts all things. And in, in the NJB, it says, is always ready to make allowances. So when is it that we need to do this? When, and I, I want to talk about three things, and these are the hardest things. That when will you have to extend grace? So three important times. And the first one is, when their flaws and faults irritate me. And uh, several of you, you already think of, right? Oh, I know that person and the flaws and the faults, especially if you're married, you know those, those things that get under your skin. But here's the truth, that both people in the relationship are flawed. You don't have a perfect one and the other is imperfect. We have two, two people, right? And the more you know each other, the longer you are, the more you know their flaws. That you have two sinners, two, in, two imperfect people. And let me tell you this, this equation. Two imperfect people doesn't make one perfect person. It just makes more imperfect people. That, so there needs to be this grace at the, at the foundation of, of the relationships, uh, of the relationship. And, and this includes when it's parents and children, brothers and sisters, moms and dads, husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends, whether it's employees and employers, or you with your coworkers. It's still going to have to be, if you're going to have a relationship that's of, of loving, everlasting love, of love that lasts, that you are going to have to extend grace. Proverbs 17.9 says this, disregarding, disregarding another person's faults preserves love. Do you see what it says? Disregarding another person's faults. It's like the story, the story of, I've heard of a lady who was at church and somebody else comes and, and brings up a story. Hey, you remember what your husband did that time and all this, you know, and how hard that was? And, and she says, oh, I, I distinctly remember forgetting that. <laughs> I distinctly remember forgetting that. So she, she wipes, she's disregarding it. Why? Because it's a choice to forget. It's a choice to love, to, to, to be able to move past that. In Ephesians 4, 2, it says, Be humble and gentle by being patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because 
of your love. Do you see what it says? Making allowance for somebody else's fault. Make an allowance. Of, you have allowances before that you decide, look, if they're going to do this, I'm going to be able to move forward and not, and not focus on that. So he, what he says here is that, so the question to you, are you loving? <laughs> he says it in there, right? Because of your love. Are, are you humble? Are you gentle at those times? I know my wife would say, yeah, there are times you're not too gentle when you're telling me certain things, and she knows there are times that she isn't either. But you are none of those if you are critical of other people's flaws and faults. If you're going to be completely critical of somebody the, and, and look at them and, and be able to like just come and, and nail them for whatever the, it is they're doing, that there isn't this kind of loving, gentle, and, and humility that God is asking us to have. Because if you do those things and if you, if you hold, them, hold them to all that they do, the truth is that you are being prideful. And it's not about helping that person to be better. It's a because you are irritated and, and, you think, and you think in a way that you're better than them. And I know that because I've done that. I've gotten irritated with people. It's like, why can't that person do better? And it's because I'm not seeing, hey, what about the pa- my past? What about the things I did last week? What about this? I know that I sin every day. And I need, I, <laughs> I need the grace and mercy that God gives us through his love. And if I'm not giving that same grace to other people, and I'm just getting irritated, what is it, how is it that they're going to see a love that's different? And how is that love going to endure? So the first thing is I need to, when their flaws and faults irritate me, that's when the time that I need to love them and show grace. The second is when their words or actions hurt me. That let me tell you <laughs> that human beings hurt each other. They do. I was just talking to my friend about, you know, you're st- me and Matt were talking about how sin is, is so prevalent in the world and it's so sad and why can't it be just be better? And it's hard because it can't. Because that is the nature of us and, and of our sins. And, and if it weren't for that, Christ wouldn't need to have come and, and sacrificed his life. So we as human beings hurt each other. We say things without thinking. Because most of the time, a lot of times, we're just thinking about ourselves and what we want. So, but, but grace, let me tell you this, and I want you to write this down. Grace listens. Let me say it again. Grace listens you know why we hurt each other because we're too busy talking we're too busy find instead of listening we're, we're thinking about what our, our next retor- how we're going to retort whatever they're saying before you know so you know it's like a comeback you know are you fast with comebacks it's because you're not listening to the other person you're thinking about what you're going to say and how you're going to win it's funny some uh, a funny anecdote this is that you know i used to live in brazil i used to live in a farm for a while and I remember, you know, if you live on a farm and close to water, that there's there's gonna be uh, there's gonna be frogs and toads and stuff. So, so uh, did you know that bullfrogs, when they croak, and you know those, they, it, it, you kind of get used to to their croak, right? But they when they croak, they have a, a muscle in their throat that when they do croak, that muscle cancels that frequency to their brain, so they can't hear how obnoxious they are. Did you know that? They can't hear that croak. So what, the reason I'm saying this is because we're a lot like bullfrogs sometimes. We don't realize how obnoxious we are when we're talking, 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 and the person just needs us to listen. It's annoying. And we, we can't even hear. We can't even, we don't, we're not self-aware that this is happening. We're so justified, and let me talk, and let me say, and let me, instead of saying, let me, let me listen a little bit. Let me think of what this person is saying. Because one of the best advice in the Bible for couples, for friends, for people who are in a relationship together is James 1.19. And I think several of you have heard this one before. And it's, and it's the be, be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry. So those are things that I, I hope you remember. Write that down. Write James 1.19. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. You know, they always say, right, you have two ears and one mouth. Maybe there's a reason for that. And once, and, and once you learn to listen and, and you're, you're quick to listen and you're slow to speak, that last one, which is to anger, will automatically happen. You know why? 
because it's not about you, because you're thinking of the person. You're slow to speak, and you want to listen to what they're saying and see what's really going on. Because if you want a love that lasts, you can't hold on to anger. I'm sorry, I know we want to. You're going to have to get past that anger and maybe deal with some of it, but you're going to have to get you're going to have to let go of that of your right to hold on to that to that grudge, to that anger that you can't hold on to those hurts. Because what we'll do and what happens in so many relationships with people is we use it as ammunition as ammunition. I'm going to act like I forgive and I let this go. But you do it again or you do this something. I'm going to remind you what you did last week. And for some families, for, for some couples, I'm going to remind you what you did 10 years ago. And I'm never, you're, never going to let this go. Because the Bible says itself, it says, and it's not there in your notes. It says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Here's the reality. You've got to let it go. Proverbs 17.9 says, love forgets mistakes. Nagging parts the best, the best, sorry, the best of friends. Do you, do you know that person that nags? <laughs> and I don't want you to say it out loud there, right? But you know, you know the, the person that's very nagging, that just, you know, that doesn't, doesn't leave it alone? Let me tell you something about nagging. Nagging doesn't work. Nagging never changes anybody. You know why? Because the person knows that you're, not, you're saying that not in a loving way, that we don't do that to people that we love. Not in relationships, not in our relationships in the church either. We don't at nag each other because it's not going to work. We need to look at God's word and say what it works. In Proverbs 10, 12, the second part says, Love forgives all offenses. Which one does it forgive? <laughs> not a specific one, right? We're looking, oh, let me see the ones that I can hold on to. No, it says it forgives every one of them. And, and here's, the, here's, here's something that, that we need to think about. That you want God to forgive all of your offenses, don't you? Let me tell you that. I want God to forgive every one of them because I have stuff that I've done in my life that I'm not proud of. And I am glad that I, that I get to have that forgiveness. I don't, I don't act like I deserve it because there has been times in my life where I'm like trying to take it back. But the truth is I've accepted that he does it. But he expects us to do the same to other people. In Proverbs 19, 11, it says, when someone wrongs you, it is a great virtue to ignore it. And I know for some of you listen that, you're like, oh, it's like, ignore it. I can't, I can't ignore it. But if you're going to love and have an ever-loving lust, sorry, not lust, but love, it's going to involve extending grace to others. That means sometimes forgetting and letting go of your right to keep those things. So the times when we'll have to extend grace is when, <laughs> when we're irritated by their flaws and, and faults, when, when they hurt us, and, and last is when they sin. That, let me tell you this, your marriage partner, your friend, whoever it is we're talking about, they're going to sin. And they're gonna s your friend is going to sin against you, against God, and sometimes against, against others. But it says this in 1 Peter 4, 8. Let your love for one another be intense because love covers over a multitude of sins. And isn't this great? <laughs> I, I am the beneficiary of this, that people have loved me even through my sins. You know what kind of a love it is? It's love so much that it covers so many things. That's what God loves does. Because how it, it, co it could cover all of the sins of the world. You know what really covered that? Christ's death. That he sacrificed. One that was perfect. One that was a God. One that was a, an innocent lamb. He gave himself for us. Why? Because of the incredible love that he gave. So what do we do in that? Because I just said, you know, he wants the same from us. You know what we need to become when it comes to sin? We need to become great forgivers. Write that down. I need to become a great forgiver. That I look at others and I don't, there's not a second thought to go, you know, I'm not going to hold that against you because so much has been forgiven on my side. In Colossians 3.13, it says, put up with each other. Put up, that's, you know, the kind of the bear with each other. 
and forgive as quickly and completely as the Lord forgave you. When it comes to grace and all these things, we need to choose to extend grace over and over. And it's not this fuzzy feeling, oh, I just want to give you some grace. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this choice when it's hard. And I want you to do an exercise this week, and then this exercise, I hope it's for the rest of your life, but I want you to think of someone this week that you will choose to do this for. It's probably that person that you're having a hard time doing it, that person that you're in competition with or whatever it is. Maybe it's, it is your spouse that you need to, or a friend of yours, some, your roommate, your housemate, whatever it is. Extend grace. That's the first. The second one is that lasting love expresses faith. Lasting love expresses faith. That when you really love someone, you know what you do for them? You believe in them. And we need that you, that you have faith in them, that you trust them that you, you build their confidence, that you relieve their fears when they're, when they're having a hard time, that you tr- trust, that, you, that your trust causes them to blossom. Did you know that? that? That faith causes people to blossom, to come out of their shell and realize that they can do more. If I didn't have certain people in my life, I would have never done the things. I've, I've, I wouldn't be preaching to you today for sure. But because I've had those people, it has caused me to, to believe that, that God can use me. We need people who believe in us, and that's what love is about. Because in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, and the second part, in God's word says, love never stops believing. The, in the NIV, it says it always trusts. In the NLT, it says it never loses faith. Do you see what something that's, that's connected here? Is it's talking about love and faith. And love and faith are intertwined. You know what love is built on? It's built on trust, that you can trust each other. A lot of people think they have a love problem, that that's the reason, you know, they can't love. But the truth, the reality is they have a trust problem, that they haven't learned to trust others. And if if you don't learn to trust, you'll never learn to love. You'll never learn to be loved either, because you can't make that connection. And, and in the world, there's, there are three kinds of people. There's the, the gullible, and the gullible people are those that, that just believe anything. Right? They, don't, they don't, right, you said something, okay, no matter how ludicrous it sounds, they, they believe it, right? Then you also have the other side, that you have the cynical people. And cynical people don't trust anybody. That, but maybe because of hurts and things from their past, they, they, whatever it is, they just don't trust but then there's, the, there's loving people who give you the benefit of the doubt. And what I'm talking about is this love, that it takes love to trust, for God to put his trust in people here to do his, his work. It takes, it takes him trusting, even though he knows that we're flawed. But even when you go into, into, into the sense of what the world thinks, you know, there are psychological studies that have shown that, that trusting people, not, I'm not ta- like I said, I'm not talking about being gullible, uh, but people who choose to trust are, are far more adjusted and happier than people who are distrusting. That when you choose to trust, you open your life to possibilities of better relationships. Because the people that don't trust are, are hard and don't, they don't even give it a chance. And understand there are times that, that others have lost, you know, have, have, <laughs> you know, have taken that trust that, that you've given them and have destroyed you in a, in a sense. But I'm telling you, if, you're, if you don't deal with those things and learn to trust again, you're going to have a hard time loving anyone and becoming somebody who loves. It's what sets us apart in a lot of ways because we choose to love. In Mark 6, 5 through 6, it says, Jesus could do many things, it says Jesus could do many mighty works, sorry, Jesus could not do many mighty works there because of their lack of faith. So Jesus was in a location there where people were distrusting of him, that they didn't have faith. And he was, Jesus was going to the countryside and doing all these miracles and all these things. But it says that in that place that he couldn't do these things. And it wasn't 
because it wasn't Jesus' lack of faith that caused the miracles and healings not to happen. It was the lack of faith of the people that he was teaching that hindered Jesus from helping. So what does, what does that mean for us? How does that translate? That when others don't believe in us, it makes it harder for change to happen. We need to do this for each other. We need to believe and encourage each other. If I didn't have a, a friend named Carrie to, to help me believe in myself and say that God can use me for, for, for leading out a church plant, I would have never have come. If, uh, I, I love that relationship because, honestly, Carrie dreamed for me when I couldn't even dream for myself. And was telling me, look, you can do it. And it doesn't mean that he wasn't, he was there for me through it. And has always been. My, my wife, who, <laughs> if it weren't for her believing in me and, and helping me and moving along and saying, no, we can do this. I know it's hard, but I, I, I know that God can use me in this. And there's so many others. If I, if I, if I didn't have people like Becca and Jimmy, who, who came and, and, and believed, like, like Aldo and Eliza, TC and Maria, like Matt and Shannon, right? Uh, Ryan and Lindsay, Boston and, uh, and Whitney and Maddie, Nathan, Mark. And I could keep naming. I'm sorry if I didn't put your name in here and I didn't name everyone. But there are so many of you that I know, trust, and believe in me. That doesn't mean they don't, they don't know my flaws. They know all my flaws, and a lot of them know a lot of things. But the truth is that this church wouldn't have, we wouldn't have moved forward if we didn't believe in each other. That, that it would become this incredible burden and we wouldn't be able to go on. But because I have people on my side, I know that we can do this because we trust in each other and we trust in God. And I know that sometimes we, we go through hard times, we go through fights and that's what love is about and getting through these things but we get through them. In Romans 14, 19, it says, let us be always seeking the ways that lead to peace and the ways in which we can support, support each other. Let me tell you this analogy that any coach will tell you the best way to, to restore confidence after a guy has, has dropped the ball or, or fumbled the ball is, is give them the ball in the next play. That get, get right back out there. Show that you trust him, that he just made a major stumble. And, and, and hand him the ball in the next play and let him show that it was just a fluke. That every, well guys, everybody stumbles. Everybody screws up. Everybody messes up. Hand that person the ball again and say, I believe in you. Let's go for it. You need people who have that faith. But let me say this because also because I know that some of you have been in relationships where, where the other person was just completely unfaithful. And, I, and we put a note there. What do you do when you, when you can't trust a spouse? What do you do? Here's the reality. Trust God. Trust God. If you can't trust people, trust God. You know you can trust him. In Psalm 62, 8, it says, trust God all the time. Tell him your problems because God is your protection. It may be that what you need to be praying for is, is saying, God, you're greater, than, than, you're greater than my spouse, and I'm going to trust your work in his or her life. And you keep going at it. That before you give up on the relationship, give God a chance. Give God a chance to change you, and give God a chance to change your spouse. There was this uh, incredible poem from uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning that said this, Whoever loves believes the impossible. Why? Because love not only extends grace, love expresses faith. It never stops believing. It always trusts. It never loses faith because it's a choice we make every day. So the third thing is that lasting love expects expects the best it expects the best it's guys it, it's hopeful it's it's optimistic it's 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 forward thinking it's it's not stuck in the past here's what it says in our passage in first corinthians the third part of, of verse 7 in, in chapter 13 it says love never stops hoping 
In the Living Bible, it says it always expects the best. In the message, it says it always looks for the best. What I'm saying is that, that we need to have that hope. Hope and faith and love, those are the most important things. But we need a hope for things and keep going. Do you know what a self-fulfilling prophecy is? This is an example. It's when, when you know the person's flaws so much that, that you, you don't hope for the best. You already know what's going to happen. And, and you know what? It does. It happens. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because people tend to fulfill what we think they expect us to think of them. And you know what happens? They fulfill that expectation. It happens all the time. So if you're telling people the, the, what you already expect, you know they're, what they're going to do, that's what they're going to do. So let me ask you this. What are you expecting from your husband? What are you expecting from your wife? What are you expecting from your kids? What are you expecting from, uh, from your friends? And, and what are you expecting from yourself even? Whatever it is, we tend to fulfill the expectations. Because here's a reality. That we don't change bad behavior into good behavior by telling somebody that they're bad. Sometimes we think that's what it is. Let me just tell them all that's wrong with them. And, and maybe they'll wake up. That doesn't work. I know because I've tried it. And it just, it just leaves them into this place of hopelessness. And guys, there's a lot of hopelessness in this world. We don't need more. We need to give hope. That you can change, change bad behavior by helping them see a picture of what they could become. Isn't that what you want people to do for you? To see the best in you? To, to dream for you and think, man, you can do this. None of us want to, yeah, just tell me the, my, my worst, just so I can wallow in this. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, If you love someone, you will be loyal to him, no matter what the cost. You will always believe in him, always expect the best of him, and always stand your ground in defending him. We need to do that for people. You know what Satan's four, uh, four favorite words are? <laughs> uh, they're, you can't do it. You can't do it. And, and, and how often have you had that little thing in your head saying, you can't do it? You know why? Because he doesn't want you to do it. He wants you to continue in the place that you are. You want to be a great lover of people? Treat them the way that you want them to become. Expect the best out of them and let them know that. When was the last time that you dreamed for somebody and tell them, look, this is what I hope for you. This is, these are the dreams that I have. You, can do, you would do so well in this. And I know that for so many, they don't even think that of themselves. But when somebody dreams for them, it opens up this light that, we, that they can feel that there's this incredible love. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 is, is, is a great passage of what we need to do for each other and how we love people. It says, encourage each other and build each other up. Let me tell you something about that. You need to do that today. You know why? You know what's tr really tragic? Is when somebody says, it's too little, too late. You know when they say that? When, <laughs> when you just, we just took too long. When, when somebody's like, and it uh, breaks my heart, when, when somebody decides to leave the church. And sometimes it's, it's because they're their own things, and, and I think often it, it is because. But I think sometimes it's because we haven't gone in love and said the things that we needed to early enough. And you know why? Because we, we postpone it. Because we think we have more time. You know what, how we need to live? We need to live as, as if there's no tomorrow and encourage and love today. Because... Lasting love doesn't just expect. It doesn't just extend. It doesn't just express. The last thing that it does that in our passage is it endures. So it endures. What does it endure? Lasting love endures the worst. <laughs> and I know <laughs> here you're thinking, man, this, is, this doesn't seem like love. And I'm saying, no, this is real love. It's not those feelings and it's not the easy things. It's when we get through things. And that's when you know that somebody loves you, is that they stuck with you, they hope, that they endured, that they, that they built you up. And this part is where a lot of people fall out. Because this is about being persistent. It is about being determined 
It's about being diligent about doing things. It is resolute. It refuses to quit. It's even that stubbornness that sometimes we do need to have, that we're going to keep going. 1 Corinthians uh, 13, the verse 7, the last part, it says, love never gives up. <laughs> That's a hard one. And NLT, it says, endures through every circumstance. The NIV says it always perseveres. The message says it never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Let me set, tell you something. Marriages and relationships, they're, they're going to have, it's going to be difficult. They're going to have hard times. But it's always more rewarding to, to restore a relationship than it is to run from it. It's always more rewarding to, to work on it and make sure you can get to the other side of this problem. Because running, it, it leaves you empty and with nothing. And uh, when we do our class, Healing is a Choice, we always ask this question because it's, it's a tough class. Most people that have take, taken it know it. But it, we ask, are you ready to do whatever it takes? Are you ready to do whatever it takes? In a, in a, you know, in a marriage, if it takes you like going through, through counseling again and, and dealing with this and bringing the person back in, are you ready to do that? In your relationships, are you ready to love that person even though they're, they're abandoning something? That's what marriage is about. It's about, you know, the idea of locking that old ball and chain, you know, to you and, and throwing the key away. And the reason you do it is because you understand that there, there's going to be bad times. And that decision needs to make before those bad times come. You make them, for example, when you get, when you get married. And, and I'm not only, like I said, I'm not only talking about marriage, but you make these decisions when you, as you have a relationship with somebody. And you're connecting. That as friends, you're not just going to walk away and abandon them. That you're going to work through it. And I, and I wanted to read this passage. It's in, in Hosea. And Hosea is one of those tough books to read. Because God asked his prophet Hosea to go and marry this, this, this woman. And he married her. And she was somebody that, that ended up going into adultery. She ended up going into prostitution and abandoning him several times. And God keeps telling him to go back to go back and take them. Why? Because this is the kind of love he has for his people that we constantly abandon and go out. But we need to have that same kind of love for people. He's asking us to do the same. So in Hosea 3.1, it says, Then the Lord said, Hosea, go and get your wife again. Bring her back to you and love her, even though she loved adultery. And I don't know who this, this verse is, is for today. That some of you have a, a spouse or you've got a friend or you've got a loved one or you know, a partner of somebody who's, who's walked away from God. And I know that's got to be hard. And they've walked away from God and said, I don't even believe in God anymore. And, God's, and God says, I don't want you to walk away from them. I don't want you. That they need you now more than ever. And sometimes we, we get the wrong impression that, oh, now so you want to go, just go. But they need you. It says here in Job 6.14, it says, When desperate people give up on God Almighty, their friends at least should stick with them. Are you that kind of a friend that you don't give up no matter what? That if that person is ready to get up and, and go, you're, you're there for them. That are you ready to love people? Through, through their worst. And it takes making that choice to love, not the feeling. Stop thinking of this feeling, you know, the fuzzy, I'm not, I just don't like this. I'm not talking about liking somebody. I'm talking about loving. At the moment, it doesn't feel like it's worth it. It doesn't. Those feelings will tell you that. But if you have chosen to really love, you're going to do it, and you're going to continue it. So these loving choices we've been looking at, so extending grace, ex expressing your faith that you believe in them, expecting the, the best, hoping for them, and enduring the, rose, the, the worst. You know what these are? This, this, this is an, a pure example of how Jesus loves you. That what Jesus does is he extends grace to you. You know how? In the most, the craziest way we can think of that he died, he gave his life for you. That, that Jesus expresses faith in you, and you're like, how does he do that, right? In the first place, he gives you the freedom to make choices, knowing that, that there's a risk of you rejecting him. 
He lets you, he doesn't force you to love him. He gives you the freedom of, the, of this choice, of this free will. That's how he expresses faith in you. He expects the best from you. You know why? Because he knows your potential. And nobody knows it more than God does. He knows that, that, that in there, there's, you know, if, if you just believe in him, that there's so much that you were made to do. And he believes and expects in you. And here's another thing. He never gives up on you. He never gives up on you. And, and he's, he's waiting for you to come home. That's how God shows his love. Is that you? Because if you want to learn to love this way, then you need to have a relationship with Jesus because he's the one who teaches these things. He's the one who showed it and exemplified it. There is no other way except through him. That some of you have been, been coming for, for a while but have not made that decision. That you're trying to find love sometimes in all the wrong places. That you're trying to find fulfillment in the things that you buy and the things that you do. And you'll never find it. Because it's only in God that we fulfill those things. And some of you here have committed long ago. But for some reason or something happened that made you stop trusting that God's love is real. You need to get back to that. You need to start trusting again so that you can learn to love others again. And some just need to realize that we have a world out there of lost people who just want to be loved. And we have that love that God has given us. You have a chance and a decision to make today. Uh, there's a link there to a what we call our communication card. And that communication card is, is you know, usually it's just a piece of paper that we have. But it's, it's, a, it's a form of you making a decision today. And there's a place for you to put your information there. And then there's a space a spot that says my decision that my decision today and it has several places for you to mark i'm going to say a prayer as we go through this and pray with you about those things dear heavenly father we thank you so much for the incredible love that you've given us lord it's it's the impossible of thinking that that we could get away with things and it's not really that we get away with them it's the idea that you are so merciful you are so compassionate and so loving and so gracious to us that you would give your son, that you would pay for our debts. Lord, I could never pay for that debt. There's nothing that I have. Lord, but because you've paid my debt, that my decision is, is to love you and to love others. Lord, for people that are here today and trying to make a decision, Lord, I hope that they make that decision for you, that you have something incredible to give to them. Maybe it starts with with they, they, they want this love, but they don't know what it's about, Lord. Maybe it starts with marking that first one li they'd like a personal Bible study. That, you're gonna, that you've provided people here in our church that can help them understand that and get through it and know the hopes that you have for them. Lord, for others, they've been through these studies and, and, and they just, just haven't decided to surrender. And I'd, I'd urge them to mark that when I would like to be baptized. That it's surrendering to you and the love, Lord, and there's nobody that's loved like you and your son have. Lord, help us never to, to forget that. Maybe for others that are here, it's because of the hurts that they've had in the past, of people who, are, who, who abandoned them, who people who, uh, who abused, who maybe it's because of addiction or divorce, and, and there's so much brokenness, Lord, sometimes because they've lost people in their life. Lord, we know that those things that you want to to make those things heal, that you want to help them. And we have classes here to help people do that. But we know that it's going to take from all of us, including our members that are here, to remember that we need to make that decision, this choice, to keep going, even when it's hard, even when we have to endure. But know that you have something incredible to give us, Lord. And for our, our members here, we know that we ask for their generous donation. And Lord, that's their commitment and that they do mark on that card. But we ask our our guests here, for them to know that, that you have brought them or that you have connected them in some way to give them something incredible, not to take any money, Lord. We ask them not to donate, but to just mark on that card something that will be life-changing, Lord. Thank you for so much for your son and his incredible love, Lord, that if it wasn't for him coming and showing that, that we wouldn't know a different love. But because he did, we get to have this everlasting love and we get to show it to others too. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And uh, we thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, next week we will be in person. 
Uh, if you are still quarantining or still uh, unsure, we are going to continue our, our streaming directly from, uh, uh, from our, our services in the morning. But we hope that in some way you are blessed by this message today. Have a good week.